hello everyone i'm um I create i'm making you panelists so if you want to mute your camera uh your mic as well as turn on or turn off your camera you're more than welcome to We are having chair difficulties. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for this wonderful event and celebration of um, International Education Series. My name is Rikuzo Tumbo, an international student from Zimbabwe, and I am the coordinator for African American Office for the Department of Multicultural Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be having Matthew Cousin Polviski who is a Zen priest, a teacher, president of the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe. He first traveled to Upaya in 2006 for a week-long silent retreat after eight years of practicing in the marketplace as a political activist and journalist, he returned to join the resident body of Upaya and was ordained as a novice priest by Roshi Joy and Halifax in early 2016. Since 2017, he has served in various roles at UPI, including president, resident director, practice mentor, and dog walker. And today he is here to engage with us in a discussion about the way of Zen, Zen philosophy, and practice in the modern world. There's going to be a short survey at the end of the presentation. Please take the survey as it helps us with programming and accreditation. At this moment, I would like to welcome Matthew Kozen and Paul Vesky, and I'll let him take it away. Oh, thank you, Catalina. Thank you, Rokuzo. And uh, to Diana, who I know is here with us, and to the Multicultural Affairs Department and everyone who joined us. I um, twisted uh, Catalina's uh, arm to make this <laughs> something where we're all panelists because I wanted to ask some questions as we got going and I wanted to see people's faces and all that, but I'm guessing you're all kind of doing your own thing maybe in your pajamas somewhere, maybe multitasking. But if you're willing to turn your camera on at the beginning, just so we can see each other, please do. And the question I really wanna to ask to begin with, and you can just put this in the chat or uh, 
you can unmute and say it is uh, a what brought you here? Why are you interested in Zen? And uh, b when you hear the word Zen, what do you think? What, you know, Zen is kind of everywhere in our culture. There's a moving company in this side of Santa Fe called Zen Movers. So we see giant Zen mover trucks going by all the time. And I'm just curious, kind of what associations you have with Zen in general. So either writing or if you just want to unmute, we don't have to be formal about it. What brought you here and, and what do you think Zen is anyway? If I could answer, um, the reason that I came is because I suffer from anxiety and just sounds like something that might be able to help me with like my mental health. Great. Thanks, Shauna. Right. We, we come to meditations and Buddhism looking for um, something to help with suffering in very wa various ways. Sarah? Yeah, I did um, my uh, psychiatrist is a Zen Buddhist and uh, he asked me to research and start doing Zazen and um, I have been trying for a couple of years <laughs> with varying levels of success. Yep, um, me too. <laughs> and so um, occasionally I get up to 20 minutes when I'm very excited about, but usually it's only between five and 10. But yeah, I just, I wanted to hear um, what you had to say and see if it, you know, if it gave me, uh, more information to work with yeah thank you sarah maybe a show of hands has anyone never heard of zen or never meditated this is totally new you were like oh there's this zen thing no okay so anyone has some association elise or a little bit um maybe one or two others why are you here what interests you about zen well, I meditate as much as I can, and uh, there are clear effects on my mental health when I do. Um, and so I try to continue uh, up and downs. And so, but I came across, I have a small Zen booklet in my um, um, library, and I, I've just moved, so I found it and I started reading. And so when I started listening to um, a Zen um, podcast, mm -hmm. so everything just, put, you know, just of interest. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I associate Zen with with um, the Chinese philosophy and uh, uh, very smart because uh, it is so grounded in, in China. Even though Zen is the the Japanese word of it, um, and I'm reading over here uh, that someone needed to attend a cultural di diverse event, and thus they're here. <laughs> uh, and that someone visited a Buddhist retreat house and felt like it was a peaceful, calm place and is a novice yoga med and meditation practitioner. So everyone, it sounds like a lot of people um, have a little bit of experience in meditation, have some sense of what Zen is, um, maybe came to practice feeling that there's a peacefulness or a uh, equanimity that may arise from the Zen tradition. Uh, sorry, everyone, I'm in a shared office with my fellow priest and he's very popular. He gets a lot of phone calls. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Zen is historically, um, some of the history and philosophy of Zen and then um, we'll do a little practice together, just meditating together, just being present in the way that Zazen invites us to. You're welcome to keep your video on, to turn your video off. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a conversation, see what came up, any questions you have. I kind of promised in the blurb to talk about the intersection of Western philosophy and, and Zen philosophy. I'm not going to do that so much, but if you have questions about it at the end, happy to talk about it. Western philosophy was my major in college, and then I went to uh, divinity school and looked at the intersection of the two of them. But Zen is far, puts an emphasis on our immediate experience and kind of de-emphasizes 
the notion of uh, a cosmic view or a kind of um, ontological perspective. What is the truth of this life? Why are we here? Those are not the starting point. The starting point is what is it to be present with one another? What is it to be kind to one another and to relieve suffering for ourselves and others? So we're going to start there together. And let me just move this. Um, I'm going to pin myself so I see what you're seeing. So I'm going to start at the beginning, which is, um, or rather just to say a bit about myself. Uh, I've been practicing here for eight years uh, at Upaya. And Upaya Zen Center is, is both a community of practice for people around the country and around the globe. Um, and it's also a training center. So we train chaplains. We have a lot of uh, retreats around neuroscience and kind of the mind and life sciences, looking at what is the cutting edge perspective on what mindfulness uh, really looks like in the brain and what kind of activities can change our life in a measurable way. And then we spend months at a time in deep, what we would call monastic retreats. So we do both. Um, and I came with a general interest in Buddhism from the time I was very young. So many people who come here and who find themselves in this kind of practice have some sort of um, intention to be a monk in them, whether it's you know really to do that with their lives or just to nurture that part of their being. This is where they come to do that. And I was the same way. I did not expect to move in and become a priest, but one thing led to another and that's where I am now. And uh, it began with this interest in Buddhist philosophy. And that's where Zen begins. So Zen, like all Buddhist traditions, begins with the Buddha and begins with the Buddha's awakening under the Bodhi tree. So the Buddha's story in you know, five sentences in a nutshell, he was a prince around 500 BC. He uh, wasn't exposed to kind of the world. He was cooped up behind the walls of his castle. And he goes out one day and sees the truth of uh, sickness, death, suffering of all kinds, and it shakes him. And he goes out to follow um, a spiritual path. And he becomes an ascetic for six years, really eating very little, doing very little, meditating all day long. And he becomes very skinny. You know, there's a kind of um, life of extreme simplicity. And after six years, he's exhausted. He doesn't feel like he's made any headway. And he kind of leaves that path and his community who's all on that path together and looks for the middle way. That's why the shorthand for Buddhism is sometimes called the middle way where uh, he's not negating his life, his body, and he's not giving in to uh, the cravings of the earthly or worldly world. And one day he's sitting under the Bodhi tree and he's just accepted a bowl of rice um, from a passerby. And he decides to sit until he rakes up to this truth of what is suffering and how do we find our way out of suffering. And in different traditions, the story is told different ways. In our tradition, he sits under the Bodhi tree for eight days and eight nights. And as the morning star is rising on the final uh, early morning of the eighth day, he's had all these battles with Mara, the kind of uh, goddess of mischief and of temptation uh, over these eight days. And he finally uh, says, you know, you have no hold on me. And she says, who are you to say that? And he touches the earth and he says, the earth is my witness. Uh, I and all beings together realize our true nature of being free of this suffering, of being uh, awakened together. And that story is the beginning of what will end up being Buddhism. He then leaves the Bodhi tree, is hesitant to teach, ends up teaching in Deer Park, and then teaches for another 45 years of his life. And from those 45 years, we have an extensive uh, group of texts, the kind of original canon of Buddhism called the Pali Canon. 
Pali being P-A-L-I, which is the language of the time. Sanskrit was kind of the aristocratic language. Pali was the everyday language. And all of these sutras are written in Pali. And there are many of them. And they're very uh, long and they were memorized. So they're repetitive. They, they have a kind of structure to them to allow people to memorize them well, similar to uh, ancient Western texts uh, and like Homer's texts. Um, and then, so his basic teachings, which are the basic teachings that we all return to, are that there's suffering in life. Life includes suffering. That the um, basis for that suffering or where that suffering arises from is our craving. The Pali word is tanha. It means thirst, most literally, that we crave for uh, pleasure, that we crave uh, fame, that we crave uh, adoration and all these things that we think will make us uh, finally whole or better or at ease. But it's the craving itself, it's feeling that we need something that is the source of suffering, he says. And then the third truth of these four noble truths is that there's a way to liberate ourselves from this endless cycle of craving from a Western perspective, we might call it the hedonic treadmill, the kind of constantly needing something, needing more. And he lays out a path, the fourth noble truth for how to free ourselves from this uh, craving that leads to suffering. And there's a wonderful teacher, modern teacher, Stephen Batchelor, who uh, kind of turns these original teachings a little bit. And he says, instead of truths, as I said at the beginning, seeing Buddhism as an ontology can be problematic. He sees it more as a pathology, a way to um, heal, a way to apply lessons day by day. And that's why we call Zen a practice, not a philosophy. And he says, we can see them as four tasks rather than four truths. So these original te teachings are telling us to one, embrace life. This acknowledgement that life includes suffering is an invitation to embrace everything as life. Um, Two, to let go, that rather than holding on, which is kind of the stance of craving, rather than this closed fist of I have and of me, mine, um, we can let go and allow ourselves to be with and be part of and be in a flow with the world. To three, to stop grasping. So letting go isn't enough because we continually want to uh, go back out and capture the world, get what we think will make us safe and happy. So we notice that and we let go of grasping. And then the fourth is to act or to live. That, you know, understanding these things is not enough. We have to live fully our life, wholeheartedly live our lives. So this is the early teachings of Buddhism. And um, about 400 years later, Buddhism ends up being very successful in Northern India and Southern India. Uh, it travels a bit through uh, what's now Tibet and China, but it's really this uh, very rich Indian tradition over these 400 years. There's 16 early schools. And in the first century, this uh, famous Indian philosopher Nagarjuna uh, puts a little twist on the tradition. And you could say he's the founder of uh, what ends up being Zen. And Nagarjuna, uh, who's in central India and is said to have uh, received these teachings from the Naga. There's all sorts of great mythologies around him and around early Indian tradition. Uh, and the Nagas are these kind of water snake beings. Uh, Nagpur is the city in the very center of India named after them. It's where he was. And he teaches, he adds two things that over the next few hundred years are hotly debated, but end up being the additions and kind of foundations of Mahayana. The two things he adds are um, the teachings of emptiness. These are teachings the Buddha gave later in his life, but they weren't emphasized in the early traditions. And so emptiness or shunyata, we sometimes describe it as boundlessness, is this kind of central tenet of Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, as well as Tibetan Buddhism, Korean Buddhism, all these traditions that came out of this. Um, and this tenet basically says, that we think things are solid and have a kind of essence that is them. 
We think that about ourselves. We think that about the computer in front of us and the table. We think about each other, the trees outside, the birds we hear. We think there's something there that is separate from everything else. The early teachings uh, kind of get at this. They say, we think that there's a self we have to perfect, but there is no self. This is something the Buddha teaches. The, the self is um, many, we could say, uh, a constantly changing interaction of many things, that it's one kind of whole solid thing, isn't so much the way Buddhism would look at it. And uh, this was a very important thing to say because it, in India at the time, that tradition was saying perfection of the self, the Atman was kind of the goal of spiritual path. And he's saying, on Atman, there is no self. We don't perfect ourselves. We exist with all things. And Garjana will come around and say, actually, it's not just that we're made up of the five elements. He'll say everything is change. Everything is empty. It's a really um, uh, kind of textured philosophical point. I'm not going to get into it, but we can just make a point about language when we're thinking of emptiness. So we could look outside and see a tree and we could say, well, that is a elm tree. And then someone might ask, well, where does the elm, elm tree begin and uh, what's not the elm, elm tree begin? And we might say, well, you know, at the end of the bark. And we'll say, but there's all these parasites inside of it that make it live. Like, is that also the elm tree? Or we could say, what about the atoms that are just at the edge? Like, where exactly does it begin and end? And there's all these discourses trying to point out that we're loosely defining things in a useful way, but that those definitions, when we look closely at them, fall apart that we can always kind of point out that we don't know exactly where things begin and end. We know this about ourselves. You know, most of the uh, um, microbes or cells in our body don't have human DNA, but we call this all our body. This is all us. So what's us and what's not us? And in a kind of grand way, the emptiness teachings are saying, it's actually important to have this language that's a little rough and dualistic but that ultimately we have to remember that it's just a tool. And then at, at, at some other level, there's no difference between all these things. We're all just interacting, or we would say co-arising. So that's the first thing. The second thing that Nagarjuna or the early Buddhists um, add is the bodhisattva path, which is we don't practice to perfect ourselves or to kind of escape suffering. We practice to wake up together to serve one another. So this is all kind of the history of Mahayana Buddhism. And then uh, in the fifth century, um, there's a monk who goes up to, uh, from India to China, Bodhidharma, famous monk. And he's in, Buddhism's already up in China, um, kind of everywhere, but he's a practitioner of this particular way. And he's already old at the time. He's already, uh, as the legend have, has it, in his 70s when he goes to China. And he becomes very famous teaching around. And the emperor invites him for an audience. And the emperor says, you know, great teacher, Bodhidharma. I've built all these temples, all these Buddhist temples all around China. And I've um, made all of these offerings to the Buddha. How much merit, how much good karma have I uh, generated? for myself and my country. And Bodhidharma says, no merit. You've generated no good karma for you or your country. And the emperor says, who do you think you are? What, what an absurd thing to say, who are you? And Bodhidharma says, I don't know. Uh, it, the question uh, he took seriously, he said, I don't know. And he went from there to what's now Shaolin Monastery, and he sits in meditation facing a wall for nine years on that question, you know, who am I? Who are any of us? And he becomes a teacher after that who kind of begins the lineage of what's called Chan in China, which is just the Zen lineage. Zen is a Japanese word. And uh, six years later, uh, six uh, ancestors later, so six, Six generations later, there's a, another famous teacher, uh, Hui Neng, 
and the koan tradition begins. Maybe you've heard of these kind of Zen stories, Zen koans. And then um, in the 13th century, so Chan flourishes in China, becomes the main tradition in uh, the many empires of China. For a while, it's, it's very uh, heavily persecuted. It's why uh, this that we wear is um, developed in the eighth century during this persecution, because monks had to wear robes against their skin. So the robes that are the full body became small. We now wear both and they would wear them under their clothes to hide that they were monks. And then in the 13th century, uh, a Japanese Buddhist, Dogen, uh, who's very kind of bright young man and is a little uh, not thrilled with Buddhism in Japan, goes to China looking for the true thing. And he meets a teacher, Ru Jing, and uh, he practices with him on these stone slabs sitting in meditation. And Buddhism had become a kind of um, very political religion at the time, very philosophical, a lot of um, big ceremonies for heads of state and for funerals. And he was looking for what, what's beneath all this. And for Ru Jing, it was meditation or zazen. And they just sat in zazen day and night together until Dogen woke up. Uh, Ru Jing was uh, actually next to him, uh, waking up someone who had fallen asleep in meditation at some, I'm sure, ridiculous hour. They sat all day. And he said, you don't fall asleep to the person next to Dogen. He said, in Zazen, body and mind drops away. And Dogen heard that and something clicked for him. He said, oh, body and mind drops away. And he goes to Ru Jing's room and he says, I've had a realization. And Ru Jing says, well, what is it? And he says, my body and mind has dropped away. And Ru Jing says, very good. And Dogen says, don't uh, affirm my realization too quickly. And Ru Jing says, well, say some more words. And Dogen says, dropping away has dropped away. And that's the beginning of what we call Zen. Uh, Dogen uh, brings that back to Japan and begins uh, Soto Zen school. There's also the Rinzai Zen school that continues th through today and in the 60s and 70s that's brought to the US. So this is all just kind of an arc of how Zen ended up here and a little bit about how this tradition transformed as it moved from place to place. Um, and I think there's two important things to realize about this tradition. One is that its, uh, its teachings are very conducive to uh, accepting whatever context it's in. So its early teachings have so much of the cultural context of India. Its later teachings in China take on so much of Taoism, which was the predominant philosophy of the time there, and some Confucianism. And so we say things like the way, which comes from Taoism. Uh, there's a sense of the ineffability or the poetics of Zen. Often these stories that are trying to point at what we're doing are very short, very pithy, very witty. That is the culture of China in that middle medieval era. And then it comes to Japan and it takes on this very refined aesthetic, straight lines, calligraphy, like what you see behind me. And now that it's in the US, there's this question of, you know, what does Zen look like in this context, this multicultural context, this context of being very much in society, in the world in a particular way. Um, and we're figuring that out. We don't really know in generation after generation as Zen flourishes here, it becomes something that's uh, appropriate for this context because we're not Japan, we're not China, we're not India. Um, so I wanna tell one story, you know, we think of kind of peacefulness, we think of uh, equanimity and reducing stress. There's an aspect of this teaching from the beginning that is very vigorous, that is very um, much about throwing our whole life into the practice of waking up and of serving and not, um, not about tuning out or kind of settling down. So uh, Bodhidharma who came from India to China and began this lineage there, 
famously not only sat facing a wall for nine years, he plucked out his, uh, eye, his eyebrows and his eyelids and he threw them off because he wanted to meditate constantly, never sleep. And as he threw them off, the story goes, they, uh, uh, green tea bushes grew where they landed. And that's the story of the beginning of green tea, that there's this um, vigor to the tradition. And, and he really is emblematic of it. You'll see paintings of him and his eyes are kind of wide like this all the time. And he looks kind of like this. And he's just, he's, he's driven to figure out who am I? What is this? And his first student so badly wanted to study with him that they, he uh, waited outside of his room in the monastery for weeks saying, will you be my teacher? And Bodhidharma said, you're not serious enough. Uh, you know, do you, how, how badly do you want to practice the way? And eventually he chopped off his arm and he handed his arm to Bodhidharma. And Bodhidharma said, okay, we'll practice together. So th the tradition is not always that uh, kind of ab absurd or um, militant in its structure, this kind of... Um, kind of youthful male energy that you imagine in that story. But there's an aspect of it that certainly is, um, that all the, through the thousands of years, the kind of um, drive of it and the openness, the warm-hearted, grandmotherly kind of approach are both present and interwoven into each other. And then there are these wonderful stories that come out of China I want to read one. There's a collection of them. They're called koans. And we sometimes think of koans as these riddles and a teacher will give you the riddle and then you have to kind of figure it out. Like uh, if a tree falls in, a wood, in the woods and there's no one to hear it, it doesn't make a sound. Or what's the sound of one hand clapping? But they're also just stories. Koan actually means public case. You can imagine them like legal cases that are held up as precedent in U.S. law. Here's the case, Roe v. Wade, that's used to describe why we do things a certain way, uh, or any, any public case. We do this with Supreme Court cases. Well, in Zen, these are kind of the cases that show, okay, how do we point directly at the mind or at our experience or at the intimacy that's always between us and whatever we're with? So this is uh, one of those cases from a famous teacher in China, the Chan era. And it's from a collection called The Gateless Gate, or The Gateless Barrier. So this old teacher, Joshu, earnestly asked Nanzen, Joshu is actually a student in this. He becomes a famous teacher. Nanzen is his teacher. He says, what is the way? And Nanzen answers, the ordinary mind is the way. Joshu asks, should I direct myself toward it or not? Nanzen says, if you try and turn toward it, you only go against it. And Joshua asks, but if I do not turn toward it, how do I know that it's the way? Nanzen answers, the way does not belong to knowing or not knowing. Knowing is delusion. Not knowing is just blank consciousness. When you have really reached the true way beyond all doubt, you will find it as vast and boundless as the great empty firmament. How can it be talked about on a level of right or wrong? At these words, Joshin was suddenly enlightened, which is often how these stories end. And in the collection of all these koans, there's a verse that goes with the case. And the verse to this case goes like this. The spring flowers, the moon in autumn, the cool breeze of summer, the winter's snow. If idle concerns do not cloud the mind, this is man's happiest season. So I'll read that just one more time and then maybe we can sit together. The spring flowers, the moon in autumn, the cool breeze of summer, the winter's snow. If idle concerns do not cloud the mind, this is man's happiest season. So, Maybe there's something in there that resonates the sense of everyday mind being the way. 
And um, I'm gonna ask that we all um, meditate together just to, to get a sense of what this might feel like, because I've probably said too many words already. And so um, follow along as much as you uh, wish. You can just let my words wash over you to whatever extent that makes sense. But we begin in meditation with our posture. And so I'm standing, but if I were in a chair, I would sit uh, kind of on the edge of the chair, um, where I on a cushion on the floor, I'd be sitting on the edge of the cushion. We're embodying with our body a stance or a posture of dignity and of openness. That's why you see this particular pose in Buddhist uh, statues. So we're finding a straight back wherever we are, kind of uprightness. And we're finding an open chest and open shoulders, a welcoming and open to the, to the world to the next moment. So strong and rooted back, open, welcoming, compassionate front. And rather than close our eyes, in Zen we keep our eyes open but cast down. The notion being that we don't close any of the sense gates, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, our skin, or, and our mind, thoughts being the sixth sense gate. We keep everything open and easeful, not looking for something or listening for something, just receiving. So you could cast your mind, your eyes down in front of you, wherever they choose to land, holding a soft gaze. And just take a couple breaths and arrive where you are. Whatever room you're in, whatever time of day this is, allowing what's happened before to subside and what happens next, not to be an issue yet, but arriving right here. You might say to yourself, breathing in, gathering my awareness, breathing out, dropping my awareness into my body. Breathing in, gathering, breathing out, dropping into the body. And then set your intention for practicing. You may just ask yourself, what do I want from this? Or why do I show up to meditate? Maybe it's to reduce stress or to show up better for others, or to help reduce suffering in yourself and others. Whatever arises, just noticing the sensation in your body of your intention. And you can put your hands on your knees or your lap. And then allowing that intention to be the ground on which you practice the perfume of this practice. Bring your awareness to your breath in your body. It might be in your chest or in your belly. And on inhale, notice your belly rise. And on the exhale, notice it fall. Finding that point, that place where your breath is filling. On your next exhale, we can begin to count the breath on the exhale. The mind likes a story, and so we give it this, the very semblance of a story, counting from one to 10. Inhaling, exhaling one. 
Inhaling, exhaling two, and so on at your own pace. Being aware of the breath and the sensation of the body. And if you lose count or you start thinking about the past or the future, just notice that you've gone elsewhere and return to the breath and the body, beginning again at one. No judgment, no doing something right or wrong, just noticing and returning. And as we practice in this way, we'll notice the thoughts arise naturally. Our goal is not to stop thoughts or to not think. Simply to allow thoughts to arise and not cling to them. These thoughts are not your thoughts. They're not true or false. In sitting in this way, we can imagine our awareness as the vast sky, encompassing everything, allowing anything to enter and to exit. And so as thoughts arise, you can imagine them like clouds. Small and fluffy or large and dense, but just clouds. And by returning to the breath and the body without grasping or pushing away, we embody that vast and open sky. And then for a little bit, for this last minute, stop meditating. Any notion you have of doing something special or sitting zazen, just stop and sit and breathe. And then as our final breath of this practice, we would dedicate whatever good has come to sitting in this way, to practicing together in this way, to the benefit of others, of all beings. And traditionally, we bow together. So that's a short meditation. Uh, Zazen, sometimes called the method of no method. 
Uh, so there's very little to it. And then if you do it a lot, you find doing very little can be very hard. Uh, but I hope that was uh, useful or um, engaging for you in some way. And I want to open it up to questions or any conversation people want to have. So thank you so much. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, would you consider Buddhism a culture or like a religion or neither? Who's asking? It's Shauna. Hi, Shauna. Um, very good question. Um, the hotly debated right now. Uh, Stephen Batchelor, who I mentioned, would say it's not a religion, wrote the book Buddhism Without Beliefs. Um, most people um, who are his peers and practitioners, contemporary practitioners, would call it a religion. I think it, it depends what you hang that word on, religion. Um, you know, the world religions, as we've come to know them, was a kind of construct developed at the, what was it, 1890, 1887, 1893 World Fair. I forget the date of the fair. Um, but there was the announcement of the 12 world religions. Uh, and that's where we get the kind of paradigm we mostly live under now. Um, and that's when Buddhism and Hinduism and, and others were kind of described as such. I think if you mean that religion includes a sense of um, a creator or um, an emphasis on a relationship with uh, a specific um, mythology, it's hard to fit Buddhism in that neatly, particularly Mahayana Buddhism, but it's certainly a tradition with um, beliefs, practices, a clergy, uh, a whole structure of texts that make up its um, kind of foundational essence. And so all those things seem pretty religious to me, but maybe not monotheistically so. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. What else? Any questions, any comments? Um, this is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi. So I have a technique question. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, you mentioned, and the, and the books that I have mentioned, that I have read say that when you sit zazen, that your eyes should be kind of softly open. Yeah. Um, and I struggle more with maintaining some kind of discipline. <laughs> um, and so I find myself staring at my nose rather than looking at the floor, because if I look at the floor, then I start going, oh, I, I didn't clean. I didn't. <laughs> um, or, yeah. um, and so I, I kind of find myself staring at my nose. So I just wondered... Uh, if that works for you, go for it. It makes me a little dizzy to stare at my nose. Uh, <laughs> a cross -eyed. But uh, it's your practice. I mean, he, you know, we, we think that this practice has to look a certain way. Uh, and that can be a real impediment for us. Right. Um, and so allowing your own wisdom to be, well, what works for me to settle my mind, to be present of the sensations that are arising as they arise, and to settle all my senses, including my sense of sight. And so wherever we place our eyes, that works for us. You know, there's wall gazing is a very common practice where you look straight ahead at a wall. This is probably right. what Bodhidharma was doing. Closing your eyes is a practice in other traditions, totally fine. We would say, or we would teach, uh, closing your eyes makes you more likely to daydream or to fall asleep. Um, right. you're, you're just visualizing things. But for some people, it really works. Or keeping the eyes open is really um, distracting. So, you know, you can you can face an area of your room that's not dirty if that helps, and 
you can look down uh, and you can kind of engage the periphery of your vision and that helps uh, soften your vis vision. So you're not staring at one thing and thus right. you don't have to be preoccupied with what you're looking at. You're just seeing shapes and colors. You're not seeing, you know, dust mites and books on the floor. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That, yeah, I hope that helps, Sarah. Uh, anything else? Uh, you know, on the religion question, uh, there's a axiom in Zen, if you see the Buddha on the path, kill him, which sounds again, a little extreme. Um, I thought the Buddha was the one we were kind of uh, all holding up as the ideal to become. But the notion of that axiom is if you think there's something that represents the thing, what you're supposed to become or what it's supposed to look like, um, then you'll grasp for it. And there's a, a way in which this tradition is um, kind of via negativa in the Western philosophies, the, the skeptical traditions um, of uh, Montaigne and of you know, Heidegger a little bit, and even of uh, Heraclitus going all the way back to Greece, these traditions that looked at the importance of uh, uh, questioning or negating our certainties. And because there's such an emphasis on that, imagining Zen as a religion that kind of holds something up, well, if it holds anything up, it's coming back to our own uh, wisdom, trust in ourselves, and trust in our community, in our kind of intimacy with what we're with. Um, and anything beyond that is seen with a kind of skeptical eye, including like, should you look at your nose or should you look at the floor? Or should, you know, all the kind of uh, dogma that can arise out of any tradition. So those two questions surprisingly kind of go together. Thank you for both of them. Uh, Catalina, I saw you ready to, to close us. I'm, I'm happy to end now. If there's no other questions, thank you everyone for joining and for listening. Uh, and maybe for meditating for a few minutes together. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Shana. Thank you very much, Koza. Thank you. We learned a lot and um, trying to kick back from that meditation session we had. Uh, <laughs> it was so soothing and, uh, and calming. So yeah, um, we had a great time. Um, although the presentation was not in person, let's give them a round of applause via chat. I'm seeing all the thank yous. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, on behalf of the International Affairs, would like to present you with the gift, um, which is an Yanami Multicultural Affairs blanket. Right. Oh. <laughs> Yay. Well, yeah, thank you very thank much. You both. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah, this marks the end of our presentation and um this event marks the end of international education series hence the next event is going to be the 19 pueblos of new mexico with michael lucero uh, via zoom um, as we kick off and celebrate native history month looking forward to seeing all of you guys there and do not forget to take the survey just after this uh, presentation is done there's going to be a survey that's just going to pop up on your screen so Again, please do take the survey. And yeah, I'd like to say have a great, wonderful day, rest of it, and thank you.